so the plan is to talk for probably about 40, 45 minutes. Invite, invite questions as, as we go along, but questions at the end. Um, give you a five minute comfort break and then uh, run through a, a SAP calculation so you get a, an idea or a, a feel for the thing. Before we start, it would be good to get a gauge of people's backgrounds and where you're coming from uh, in terms of you know, interest in the subject. Um, are there many architects, engineers in the room who are interested specifically in this as a, as a mechanism to do calculations? I saw maybe one hand, a couple of hands going up. What about people who just have a sort of more generalised interest in sustainability and, and energy use in buildings? A few more hands, quite a lot more hands going, going up. Um, my background is uh, I'm a practising architect. Um, I've been very involved in sustainability projects going back for the best part of 20 years or so, uh, both as a pr practitioner uh, and also um, involved both with Glasgow Cali University from a research point of view, but also the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland. I'm involved in running an um, energy certification scheme. Um, so just maybe to provide a little bit more background to that, um, in Scotland, I, I, was, I was hearing lots of different accents, so I'm assuming not everyone's from Scotland. Anyone from Scotland? Or a few from Scotland, a few from elsewhere. So I'll try and... Apologies to those who know all this stuff in terms of legislation in, in Scotland and the UK. Um, the building standards system in Scotland is different to the rest of the UK, um, and no doubt that obviously differs from, from everywhere else in the world. Um, within Scotland, um, unlike England and Wales, we have no form of privatisation within the building standards system. So the only people who can grant you a, what we call a building warrant in Scotland are the local authorities, the 32 local authorities. Um, however, having said that, we also have another exception, which is within our regulations there are seven sections, of which six is the energy, and it is <coughs> possible to become approved as a certifier of design for one or more of those sections. At the moment, the schemes only exist for section one, which is structures, which the structural engineers do, and there's a couple of schemes that uh, accredit or approve certifiers of design for section six energy. And one of those is, is operated by the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland. And that's kind of how I got dragged kicking and screaming into this uh, whole field. Um, as we'll go through the presentation, I will try and be very precise about terminology. And unfortunately, one of the things, as soon as you start looking at something like the standard assessment procedure, uh, and equally looking at SBEM, the Simplified Building Energy Modelling um, Procedure, which is the, the non-domestic version, if you like, for Scotland, the use of terminology becomes extremely precise. Um, and it's very easy to sort of use one or more terms to mean a whole bunch of things. In everyday life, that doesn't matter. But when you're dealing with regulators and when you're dealing with demonstrations of compliance and when you're dealing with energy calculations, and some of the terminology can, can trip you up. So that's, if you, if, if you think I'm getting overly technical or using the terminology, stop me and ask. Um, so the standard assessment procedure, the current version we have is SAP 2009. Um, there is a version SAP 2012, which will be integrated in Scotland into the 2013 review of the building regulations, um, which is due out for consultation fairly soon. Um, one of my many hats is I, I sit on the working group for the Building Standards Division of the Scottish Government um, who look at these things, uh, as do a bunch of us from various bits of, of um, industry. Um, but this almost is the first point where the terminology can start to trip you up because we commonly refer to a SAP calculation as being the calculation that you use to demonstrate compliance with the technical standards of the building regulations. Um, actually, SAP is a more generic methodology. And again, we need to distinguish the difference between the methodologies and the software. I believe the presentation will be available to all those who, who want it at some date, so please don't feel you've got a... Is the slide in the notes? It could well be. It certainly was last time I gave this. If it's, if it's not, I know it's, it's available. Yeah. So I'm sure it can be, I'm sure it can be emailed on. Um, so, yes, you, you need to be careful to distinguish between the methodology 
which describes the set of calculations and the software that can, of which there's a number of vendors that can perform those calculations for you. And like I say, we'll, I'll give you a wee demo of that um, later on. Within the SAP calculation, um, there are a number of sub-calculations. They all follow the methodology, but with differences. Um, and some of those differences can be really quite subtle. Um, and you know, they're there for specific reasons. They've been evolved over time. Uh, the key uh, calculations within that are the energy efficiency and the environmental impact ratings. And those are the numbers that go on an energy performance certificate. And we'll be talking a little bit about EPCs, which I'm sure you've all come across uh, a bit, little bit later on, and some of the legal uh, aspects surrounding those. Um, you then have a dwellings emission rating and a target, and those are the two calculations that are used for compliance. Uh, and I'll describe a little bit more about those later on. And there is also now fabric energy efficiency uh, calculation, which again follows some of these steps, um, which uh, I think has now been integrated into Partel for England and Wales, or England, Wales are going to start writing their own regs, in terms of um, compliance with the regulations. Um, the FEE at the moment has no regulatory place within the Scottish regulations. And then there's also a, a calculation of summertime overheating, um, which to a certain extent dovetails into the FEE calculation. So just to give you an idea of how marvellously simple this suite of methodologies are, um, there's a little diagram which I don't expect anybody to um, spend too much time trying to understand. But the methodology is uh, has a series of steps. There are 13 steps overall, not all of which are used in each calculation. But as you can see, it's, it's heavily uh, cross-referenced itself or, or you know, it has uh, feedback loops and things. I use this slide a lot, and I tell a story about the, um, the book that was written called Longitude, which was also made into a film or a TV series, which some of you might have seen. And it was about a prize that the Admiralty set up in the 18th century, where they put up a large chunk of money uh, in the hope that they could find someone who could build a very accurate chronometer on the basis that if you knew when Greenwich Mean Time was, wherever you are on the planet, you can take a sighting and work out your longitude. And this guy spent his whole life trying to build one of these things. And he, he would build it, and he'd look at it, and he'd measure it. And you would go, well, it's pretty accurate, but not quite accurate enough. I'll stick another cog over here. And then you go, well, that's, that's more accurate, but I'll put in another inaccuracy. I'll, I'll stick another cog over here. And he, he went quietly mad doing it for about 30 or 40 years. And this thing just grew arms and legs. And that's what SAP has done, which is why oops, we have a diagram that looks like that. So these linkages that go back have happened when SAP has been reviewed and someone said, oh, yeah, well, great, low energy lighting, that's great. That will save us some energy. We'll factor that in. And then someone says, now we've got less gains from the lighting in the room. Ah, right, well, I better stick a feedback loop in. So when you read the SAP methodology itself, it describes this in words, and it will send you slightly potty if you even attempt to read it. Um, but it's all because it's grown arms and legs and extra cogs to try and make it more accurate and then correct the inaccuracies that have been built in. This clock, by the way, is nearly 500 years old. This is in Bern in Switzerland. And it is remarkably accurate um, on the basis that every day somebody scurries up the, the, uh, up the tower, winds it up and puts it back two and a half minutes. <laughs> but it's accurate every day. Um, the important thing to remember about the SAP procedure is it's an asset rating. Um, it's not an operational rating. So the reality it may bear in terms of the number it will predict in terms of energy use and fuel use and cost are based on a series of standardised assumptions of how a dwelling is going to be used. And those assumptions relate to everything from the number of people that will be in, in the dwelling, which is based on the floor area, uh, and it relates to temperatures that will be assumed to be required. Uh, and you'll see some of that later on, but essentially it assumes that during a working day the temperature will be raised to 21 degrees in the living room, 18 everywhere else. It'll cool down in the middle of the day. It'll come back up again. Over the weekend, it comes on in the morning, goes off in the evening. And it's looking at how much energy is required to maintain that profile of use. Um, I think that holds uh, uh, an issue for 
us as an industry, if you like, because people will look at these predictions and say, well, this is nothing like my bill. And the way that you use a dwelling can have an enormous impact on its energy, quite obviously, far more than almost any other factor. So two identical houses, family of four, loads of tellies on, they like it warm, they've got the windows open, they've got the washing machine running every day, twice. Next door, you've got the old, an elderly couple, they've got a villa in Spain, they go and stay there for six months of the year. During the summer, they like it quite cool, they don't watch telly, don't need to have the washing on as often. The difference between those bills could be a factor of four, five, six. If you start looking at passive house standards, and some of you may have come across that, where, where your heating load is very, very small, some of the calculations or monitoring that the Passive House Institute have done have suggested there's a tenfold difference between the very, very lowest and the, and the highest. So we have to be careful to remember that it's, it's there mainly as a regulatory tool to, show, to try and compare apples and pears and to try and get some sort of baseline. It's not there to be used as a design tool. Producing a SAP calculation as part of your building warrant application will not mean that you've optimise the building or the dwelling in terms of its performance, it just demonstrates you've met a level of compliance, you've, you've, you've got over the threshold. Now I mentioned before there's lots of different bits of sapware out there, I think there's currently, they're, they're, they're slimming down, but there's probably still eight to ten approved providers of software. Uh, there were more at one time and they, their software will provide all the calculations and they do it from one set of inputs. So you don't have to, you know, I've told you there's all these different calculations, but they all happen in parallel uh, as you're plugging away on the thing. Um, and that includes the assumptions that uh, uh, differ between the TER and the DER. The way the TER works, the target works, certainly in Scotland, and it's, it's very similar in England, you'll find me saying all the way through, things are very similar, but there's little differences, and it's the little differences that will always trip you up. So you'll, you'll see me thinking about, can I remember what those little differences are? Usually the software deals with it. But to set a target, if you think you've designed a house, you've got, you, you know everything about it. You know the U values, which is a, a measure of how well insulated the external walls and floor and roof are. You know your heating system and its efficiencies. Um, you know where the glazing is, the orientation of that. As you plug all that information into uh, the calculator, the, the software, it, mo it models that, but it also cr creates a notional building. And the notional building is very, very similar, but not quite the same. And that is used to set the target. So, for example, if you've got a, a, a wall of whatever you value, 0.2, within the target dwelling, that will have a value that is taken from the local building regulations, which is uh, the, the target value. And if you look at the Scottish uh, technical standards, there's a table which gives you five different fuel types. Within that, it gives you a raft of things like a target U-value, uh, a target efficiency for a boiler. Um, it will give you a maximum area of glazing, which is 25% of the floor area. It will assume that's painting either east or west, for example. And there's, there's about 12 criteria in there. Those are used to create this notional, bu notional building. You can, under the Scottish regulations, say, well, I'm not going to bother with the calculation. I'll just make sure I hit all of those. I'll make sure I've got less than 25% glazing and the boiler is 93% efficient or whatever it is. Um, and that's actually uh, acceptable in terms of demonstrating compliance. Um, it doesn't help you too much because you still need to end up doing one of these calculations to produce your energy performance certificate at the end of the day. And it doesn't allow you to optimise that calculation. And again, I'd emphasize that as optimizing the calculation rather relative to demonstrating compliance. It doesn't mean you're going to produce a building that in any way, shape or, work, or form works. Um, of the 13 sections, the first one are dwelling dimensions. And um, what I'm going to do is go through, through each stage fairly quickly, um, but to give you a, a, an idea of what's taking place in the calculation. Uh, and flagging up some of the issues. One of the things I do is I set uh, the, um, or I, I develop the training and the online testing and a practical examination for architects and technologists uh, in Scotland. And so I, I get the advantage of seeing lots and lots of people attempting to do these calculations. Um, so I know where most of the pitfalls are. And there's a lot. There's a lot of different places where you can stumble. One of them is dwelling imp uh, dimensions. As architects and technologists, and apologies to those in the room who, who aren't, but we 
have a fairly a solid understanding of how you would measure a building. SAP methodology is completely counterintuitive, and the way uh, dimensions are uh, described is just different to the way, as an architect, you would necessarily think about them. And those things are quite subtle, but it's very easy for people to get them wrong. And it's down primarily to the fact that the methodology itself, uh, which has quite a long history going back uh, 20, 30 years, um, but it's been developed over time by people who come primarily from a, a numerical background and, a, and a, uh, I guess, a physics calculating, calculating type background. So when you actually give them a set of drawings, they, they, they're a little bit nonplussed and they don't understand them. And similarly, when, we, when I look at their calculations, I'm completely nonplussed and struggle to understand them. But people can get dwelling dimensions wrong. The second part of the calculation um, looks at the ventilation rate. And as you can imagine, on any, any building, but any dwelling, there's a number of factors that is impacting on the amount of air within the dwelling which is disappearing out through the building itself at any given time. So you've got flues and chimneys, um, you've got your type of ventilation system, whether it's passive or it's intermittent vents are the sort of thing you normally find in your bathroom or whether it's whole house systems. Um, and you have air infiltration. Air infiltration is the process of uh, air moving physically through the building structure, whether that's through uh, gaps where you would otherwise expect draft proofing or whether that's actually physically through the walls and through the roof. Um, and it's based on the fact that you usually have a differential pressure. As soon as you've got a strong wind blowing, you're going to have a differential pressure across, across a building. So all of this stuff is based on, on combination of theoretical work and, and monitoring that was done a long time ago, I guess. Um, in the UK as a whole, uh, over recent years, and by recent years I guess I mean anything from probably the Second World War onwards, our quality of construction has been woeful and buildings have been very, very leaky. When you actually look at how leaky buildings are, everything before pre-1919 is a bit leaky and it tends to be a bit leaky because it's old and people haven't draft proofed it and um, partly because the way traditional buildings work they required a lot of air movement through the structure and around the structure to preserve the building and to provide a healthy environment for people um, and they ignored the energy consequences of that. Uh, things actually got worse uh, with the de-skilling of the industry and the introduction of cavity wall and um, much thinner forms of construction, which predominantly happened after 1919 because all the masons had died on the Somme. Uh, and then it wasn't really until the mid-80s into the 90s that things started get, getting better when the agenda in terms of insulating dwellings came along, primarily as uh, a response to fuel poverty and increasing energy costs. Um, but even then, certainly in Scotland, nobody started looking at air infiltration rates with any seriousness until probably five to ten years ago, when people were wondering, well, we're putting all this insulation in, we've got a theoretical specification that says these houses should be nice and warm, and yet it's still Baltic in here, what's happening? And it was only then that people noticed that house builders you know, commonly would leave the insulation out, because um, no, one, no one had a mechanism to check. Um, and um, it's very difficult to tell the quality of workmanship once it's been covered up. So it's a major problem. In the Scottish regulations, same in England and Wales, there's now um, the introduction of the requirement for testing uh, is gradually being introduced and testing to meet a certain standard. And there are some pitfalls with that as well, both in terms of how you test, but also how you then develop a performance criteria that you might use in a calculation like this which you then either don't meet or indeed you over meet and increasingly you can have problems with actually over airtight dwellings because then you've got absolutely no air leakage um, to provide things like combustion air, deal with, um, deal with build up of CO2 from, from people and smells and odours and stuff like that or to provide the air for say a passive vent system. So. We're getting to this interesting thing in Scotland where people are saying, yeah, yeah, we'll just, we'll just smother everything in plastic and tape it up uh, and it will be like Tupperware, it will be fantastic from that point of view. Uh, and then other people are saying, yeah, but now the vents don't work, so what do we do? You know? And building standards will say, well, you go around with a screwdriver and you start putting holes in things. 
but that's not really a good approach. Uh, like I say, compliance with the regulations doesn't guarantee a good design. Um, section three of the methodology is heat loss and heat loss parameter. Uh, and this is basically a combination of all the energy that is, is moving out through the building fabric, uh, either directly through the windows and the walls, and that's a function of a U-value. Um, U-value is an expression of the heat loss in watts per square metre per degree centigrade with a one degree centigrade difference. So the smaller the a U-value number is, the better. Um, and you also have thermal bridging. Thermal bridging, again, is, is an area which is now being concentrated on much more within the Scottish building regs. Thermal bridging, when you look at, um, when you look at say, a cavity wall, uh, where you've got brickwork on the outside, blockwork on the inside, and you've got you know, it's plastered, it might be rendered on the outside, whatever. You've got an energy loss that's going through your plaster, and then your brick, and then your cavity, and then your brick, and then to the outside world. But every so often you've got a brick tie, and a brick tie being metal, metal is a very good conductor of energy. So every so often you have what's called a thermal bridge. You've got this little route for something to go through. In Scotland, we have a very high proportion of timber kit building compared to England and Wales. Um, so in a timber kit wall, you'll have a series of vertical studs and insulation in between, and then you've got a cavity and brickwork on the outside, plasterboard on the inside. Um, and your studs, your timber studs, are repeat linear, repeat linear thermal bridging. Now, they're dealt with within an overall U-value calculation. So you'll do a U-value calculation, calculation through the insulation and then through the stud, and you'll uh, you're average it out based on on the thickness of the stud relative to the insulation, and that's fine. But then you get, you also then get what are called non-repeat -lin non linear thermal bridges, which is invariably where you get a junction between uh, two walls, or the wall and the floor, or a floor and the uh, middle floor and the wall, or around the windows. You'll get another lump of wood in there, or you'll get a something in there. You'll get a lintel in there. Um, and up until very recently, those have tended to be dealt with by just having a sort of overall default value. All the way through the SAP methodology and the SAP software, you'll find there's lots of defaults for things that you don't know. The defaults are set at a number which penalises you, because if you go and calculate that out, you'll probably get an improved value. Um, and one of those is a default overall number for the thermal bridging. Um, increasingly what's now happening, because our regulations are getting tighter and tighter, or rather the threshold for client compliance is getting higher and higher, people are actually calculating the specific amount of thermal bridging that you've got, and then actually doing individual uh, sort of thermal modelling calculations of those thermal bridges to actually hone down on the number. And I've been going through a lot of exercises of that, which does make sense for a, quite a large volume house builder, they're not improving the product, they're just proving the product that they were building performed slightly better than otherwise they'd proved. And it makes sense if you're doing it in big volumes. Um, but to calculate a set of thermal bridging for a one-off house where you're not using, say, the form of construction that you, you've already calculated, you can spend 2,000 quid doing that. 2,000 quid, you could put photovoltaics on the roof. And you're spending 2,000 quid to prove it complies, not to actually improve it. Anyway, the heat loss um, parameter is one of those numbers which reoccurs in various places in the SAP calculation. And there's one or two of those. Water heating is um, interesting because SAP, as I mentioned before, SAP makes an assumption about the number of people in the dwelling. And it's not an integer. So based on the floor area, you might have 2.36 people. And being SAP, it that calculation varies depending on a size threshold. I mean, I'm deliberately not showing you too much of the mathematics behind SAP because, well, we wouldn't have got past dwelling dimensions by now, uh, dimensions rather. Um, there's every bit of the calculation within SAP has a long complex formula and probably three alternatives and a lookup table that says, ah, but if it's a Tuesday, you use this. Um, but the water heating is based on 25 litres per person. Like I say, there aren't necessarily whole numbers of people plus a constant, which I think in the latest version, I think the constant might be 36 now. Actually, someone pointed that out to me. It assumes that um, you plateau out at eight people. You never have a dwelling with more than eight people in it. One of the things that 
um, frustrates me a little bit about SAP um, is my concern that whether the SAP calculation and the other national calculation methodology, SBEM, whether they've actually been calibrated against real-time data. Um, I co-authored uh, a paper for Historic Scotland uh, a year or two ago, technical paper eight, um, where we were asked to look at one small cottage um, and analyze it with every piece of analytical software methodology we could find. So we use SAP, we use RDSAP, which is reduced data SAP, which is what is used for existing dwellings, um, which is something of a guess. Um, we used various bits of NHER uh, software, which are used to, to produce, um, used, certainly used to be used to produce energy ratings, primarily in the social sector, to report on those. Uh, we also used SBEM, Simplified Building Energy Modeling, which uh, was originally intended to have uh, a residential component. SBEM works in a different way, and you can do you can analyze any non-domestic building. But it originally had a domestic building option in there, and it was intended for use with buildings uh, with dwellings of 450 square meters or, or larger. Uh, SBEM is considered more accurate. The point of SAP, the, the, the original thinking behind SAP was how do we make this simple enough to actually use in the real world? And then they thought, well, actually it's too simple, so we better add some more cogs, which is why now it's incredibly complex uh, in terms of methodology, and actually SBEM is probably simpler. However, the use of SBEM for larger dwellings was scrapped by the UK government because the output from the calculations um, didn't come out in a format that could go into the central register of energy performance certificates, which is run by Landmark down south. And therefore they couldn't cope with it, so they had to scrap it. But anyway, I looked at this little cottage um, with, AS, uh, with SAP and SBEM, and it was partly to say, well, do either of these feel right? Do either of them seem accurate? The one, they, they gave very, very different predicted energy uses. Uh, but one of the ones which was um, very, very apparent was water use. And in SBEM, um, the SBEM, sorry, in SAP, the SAP calculation predicted that roughly 13% of the energy use or requirement of this dwelling would be hot water heating, whereas SBEM it was about four or five percent because it just had a different it just had a different way of doing it. It just took a, a floor area and multiplied it by just over half a litre per day. And the, you would expect those if you plotted those on a graph of of size of housing, you would have thought I thought they would coincide you know, maybe at 100 square metres, 70, 80, 100 square metres, that sort of area. That's a two bed flat or a three bed house. They actually coincided at 520 square meters. So something immediately says to me, something's not calibrated here. Um, SAP also takes account of internal gains, um, and there are lots of internal gains. Lighting, I've mentioned that before in terms of uh, low energy lighting. Uh, but metabolic rate, we're all 300 watts each. So I think, well, we've got in the room one, two, three, four, five, six, let's say 20. So we're six kilowatts. So we're enough to probably run uh, a new house in the middle of winter. You know, we'd probably need a, a friend each to come around and we, we could heat the house. You wouldn't need anything else. And that's why it was so stuffy when you all came back in and it was hot. Um, and it obviously, you know, as soon as you put people in a room, we all know that. Um, there's appliances, and again, there's just an assumption from the floor area that X amount of energy is going to come off these appliances, and then there's cooking. And I mentioned before the low energy lighting um, works against that. Ah, I thought that was on the next side, right. Before I go on from that one, of course not all the energy gains you get do you get to keep. Um, SAP works on this principle that you want your living room at 21 during certain times, 18 degrees everywhere else during certain <coughs> times. So if you get to 23 degrees, you've kind of lost that benefit. The latest version of SAP does take account to a certain extent of thermal mass. Thermal mass is just the, the amount of energy that anything, but let's say that building fabric can actually absorb and then release. So we all know what it's like. We all know the difference between uh, going into, uh, say, a, a, a traditional stone-built cottage with very thick walls, which is freezing cold, and you light a fire, and it's all very cosy and romantic, and it takes forever to get warm, but then it stays warm because the walls are warm, and it'll stay warm for quite a long time. And we all know the difference between that and going into a modern flat, which is timber-framed, heavily insulated, um, you get into the door, you feel, you feel a bit chilly, you put the fire on, put your heating on, within 20 minutes 
you're warm enough because you're only heating up the air. There's not much thermal mass in, in, in the walls. So SAP does take account of that to a certain extent, but it doesn't take account of it um, perhaps in the depth um, that fully reflects the benefit of that. And of course you can have a lot of debates about whether uh, the impact of thermal mass in terms of building comfort and the impact of radiant heat relative to air temperature and heat sources, which is why in your big cottage or your cottage, it might be quite cold, but once you've got the roaring fire going, you're quite happy you're sitting there in front of the, in the hot fire, getting quite warm on one side and freezing on the other, but it's, you know, you're actually more comfortable than uh, the air temperature might suggest. But that's another debate. SAP doesn't deal with that. Um, the other, the, uh, one of the other calculations that we did with this cottage, just to finish that bit and let you know about that bit, is we did a dynamic simulation. Dynamic simulation is incredibly complex, and it was one of the first buildings that I think has been entirely simulated because it was small enough. Normally you do a bit, you'll do an, an atrium because you're interested in how hot it's going to get or where the cooling load might be. Uh, and that was done by Strathclyde University. To give you a clue of the amount of time it took to the, do these different calculations, we did the SBEM calculation in about 15 minutes because it was a very, very simple building. The SAP calculation probably took 45 minutes to an hour, um, again because it was a fairly simple building. The dynamic simulation took five days to create. Um, but that gives you information to do with not just air temperatures, not just internal fabric temperatures, but it will give you surface temperatures. And I, was, I remember talking to the guy who produced it, fantastic guy. And I said to him simply, I said, you, you, you're going to model the roof light. There's a roof light in this thing. Uh, do you want me to adjust the U value for the angle? Because as you move a, a window, windows are tested for U values in a thing called a hox box, and they're vertical. So if you've got a roof light, you've got more exposure to the, to the sky. And you just simply adjust the U value, the amount of energy coming through. Do you, want, do you want that U-value, John, I said. And he looked at me a bit askance and said, no, no, what, what our system will do, every 10 minutes based on temperatures and prevailing winds over an entire year, we will calculate the internal surface temperature of the glass, the energy that is transferring through to the outside surface of the glass, the confection current inside the double glazed unit, the internal temperature of the outer piece of glass and the outside temperature of the outer piece of glass. And we do that in every piece of structure throughout that building, which is why you can see how long it takes to, to model. So you get a huge amount of information. The problem with that, of course, is it takes so long to model on a practical basis, no one's ever going to do that for either demonstrating clump compliance or producing energy performance certificates, okay. although you can. How would you prove it's an area shaper for a market? Um, well, you can do live on-site U-value testing, uh, and that's quite interesting because if you calculate the U-value for a solid wall, you will almost certainly get a worse value than if you measure it. So you simply have a sensor inside, outside measuring the temperature. I mean, it's, it's more complex than that, and it's, it's not easy to do. Um, but you'll, typically for a Scottish stone wall, you'll get a value of about 1.2, 1.3 when you measure it on-site, but the calculator will say 1.5, 1.6. Uh, and if you're into um, masonry construction, you're down at 2.3, 2.4. So you can't use those values in the calculations unless you've actually tested that specific wall on site. Um, which again, you know, Historic Scotland will say, and I, and, I, and I think they're justified in saying it, historic buildings perform much better than the calculation. But of course the calculation has nothing to do with reality, just getting compliance and producing EPCs. Um, Solar gains, these are all fairly obvious. You know, the sun comes through the window, you can get hot, and it varies. Um, gain loss ratio and utilisation factor. This is actually why I, I was, was pre-guessing this slide coming up. This is the recognition that, yes, the sun comes out, you get lovely and warm, but actually you're warmer than SAP says you should be. So the benefit of that um, is, uh, is adjusted through a combination of the, the gains loss ratio, like I say, there's thermal, there is an element of thermal mass taken into account in the algorithms, uh, but, um, um, but how sophisticated it is, is, I don't know, because one of the problems with a SAP calculation, less so with an SBEM or the methodology behind an SBEM, the thing about SAP calculation is it, it isn't a representation of um, the building in terms of what I as an architect would understand as graphics. 
but there's nothing in that, there's nothing in the calculation that knows what bits link to what. And that's a ham-fisted way of saying, if you've got a house with, say, a lot of glass on, on the west wall, and you've got a trompe wall, you've got a thick wall inside that's got lots of thermal mass, you'll get a lot of benefit from that solar gain because you've got something to soak it up. Um, if you've got a house where you've got the same components, but the thick wall is in the garage and it's in a, in a dark space, you'll get a comp you know, the building will, will work completely differently in terms of its thermal performance. But as far as SAP is concerned, you've got the same elements of, you've got the same components. It, it, it cannot understand the logic of that piece of design. Uh, mean internal temperature, this is, this is the number that's crunched from the assumption that you're going to have 21 in the living room and 18 elsewhere, and then when you haven't got any heating on, that will cool down and then it will cool up. So you get a mean internal temperature, which is the average over the day or the average over the month. It used to, uh, and that is used to, to define how much extra energy do you, get, do you need to get from the mean internal temperature back to the desired temperature. Um, and that tended to be described, or in previous versions, it was described as degree days, which was a kind of funny terminology. But it's like I say, it's basically trying to, the calculation is trying to work out a predicted average relative to a desired average. And it, uh, one of the other changes in SAP 2009, it does that now on a monthly basis rather than an annual basis. So it does 12 little monthly calculations rather than one long 12-month 12 uh, 12 calculation. Space cooling, we, in the Scottish regulations, we don't have anything that specifically controls space cooling. The regulations provide guidance that says you should never need cooling in, in dwellings. If you do, you've done something badly wrong with the design. Um, but it is taken into account, or in, into account in England and Wales, if I remember rightly. And this kind of, in a bit like SAP <coughs> assumes you're going to have 21 degrees C, it's going to assume that if you're too hot, you want to get it down to 24 for six hours a day. And again, on a monthly basis, it will look at, well, what is the predicted external temperature from various lookup tables? Um, and how well will the building fabric either A, cool down, or B, is insulated enough to stop you heating up in the first place? Uh, and the two munge together gives you your fabric energy efficiency. And there was talk at one point that there would be a, a maximum set for fabric energy efficiency within Scotland. Um, but I suspect that that's not going to come yet into the regulations. But again, one of the, one of the things that Building Standards Division will emphasise, uh, and I think all of us as designers would emphasise, is in terms of energy efficiency, fabric first. Get the building fabric working right before you start thinking about efficient heating systems or, if you need them, efficient cooling systems, and you do that before you then start talking, looking at necessarily renewables to add on. Um, because that, the building fabric is going to be around for longer and it's going to be more economic to improve that. With our regulations, we got to the point where probably we've got as far as you can go with the fabric. Because obviously, as you insulate things, it's a law of diminishing returns. So adding more insulation doesn't, doesn't necessarily um, provide you with that linear benefit. Um, section 9 is the energy requirement where it, uh, it kind of brings together all the different energy uses, including your lighting and your ventilation and stuff. Um, MVHR is quite an interesting one. Uh, MVHR is mechanical vent heat recovery. And again, some of you may have come across notions of Passive House and the Passive House Institute, which is German-based, and this idea that if you build a, a building that's very airtight and extremely well insulated and very low thermal bridges and all the rest of it, um, you are well served by putting in a, a mechanical ventilation system which will take warm, moist air from your bathrooms and kitchens, throw the air away but run it through a heat exchanger uh, to preheat the air coming in from the outside um, so you need less space heating to bring that <coughs> air up to full temperature. SAP doesn't provide um, particularly good results for MVHR systems until you're down to extremely low levels of air tightness. Uh, and the reason it does that is because of a little quirk within the calculation itself, where if you have an intermittent extract fan in the bathroom, SAP takes account of the fact you've taken all this warm air and you've just thrown it away. 
So you're bringing in cold air from somewhere and it's getting heated up. But it doesn't take account of um, the energy and the carbon that's being used to actually uh, run the fan. Uh, invariably, in the UK, you're probably using, you know, if you're on grid, you're almost certainly using gas or you might be using CHP, you might be using district heating. And that is actually quite an, a relatively economic fuel and has a relatively low carbon footprint relative to electricity. When it gets to MVHR, it does take account of the electricity you're using to run the fans. So again, SAP makes an assumption about how long the fans are running during the day, and it's saying you're burning this much energy and this much CO2 to offset the gain of this heat recovery. And like I say, invariably, your electricity's got a, a bigger carbon footprint than your heating fuel. So until you get down to levels where you virtually have no heating, MVHR uh, doesn't necessarily demonstrate um, compliance as easily as intermittent fans or certainly passive, fan, passive vents and things like that. Personally, as an architect, I have reservations about passive house. There's lots of it which makes a lot of sense in terms of building fabric I, and, con and understanding how ventilation works. However, in my view, an MVHR system is basically, uh, or a, a passive house with one, is basically a very large ventilation system that's big enough for you to live in it along with all your pets and along with all the cleaning materials and along with the 8,000 different chemicals that we commonly use in the building industry. Um, and my concern is if those systems aren't running efficiently and the filters aren't cleaned, you have a, you have a major problem with, um, with indoor air quality. And you can see some of those things happening already in terms of wide-scale uh, rates of asthma with uh, children in Scotland and wide-scale rates of, of um, sort of um, toxicological issues that people have. Um, but that's just me, I think. Well, it's not just me. A lot of people share that view. But that's my, that's my concern. Um, but in, on the continent, it, all, it makes more sense. I think the other, the other concern I have about passive house philosophy as a whole is we have a Mediterranean climate, or not Mediterranean, we have a maritime climate. I always made that mistake. If only, you see, wishful thinking. We have a maritime climate um, where, you know, we have a gradual variation between cold and unreasonably warm. Um, when you look at the continent where Passive House started, they tend to have a climate which will be very warm in summer, and then it will switch fairly dramatically into cold into winter. And they also have a uh, particularly in places like Switzerland, and I suspect Germany and Austria as well, but particularly somewhere like Switzerland, they have a thing called Minergy, which is very similar. They have a virtually zero CO2 grid because their, their electricity production is hydro and nuclear. So their, their uh, motivation is as much to do with breaking a link with imported fuels as it is with some of the other parts of the agenda. So, you know, these calculation methodologies may seem to sit over here in their own sort of nice little world, but actually some of the numbers that get crunched into it are influenced very much so by politics and other agendas. So we got to the point in the calculation where the SAP, the TER, the ER, they all start to diverge off into their own little bits, and we get to the point where we're not actually having to input too much information, if any. Uh, the first of those is fuel costs. So the SAP bit says, right, based on my assumptions, uh, we've worked, decided how much energy is being used. We know what each of those energy sources are, whether it's electricity or gas or whatever, and I'm now <laughs> going to convert that into money so I can give a, a, a total energy cost. And it's that which is then used as the SAP rating in terms of a lookup table. Uh, again, it's a bit of a hostage to fortune because you're predicting using a methodology that sticks around for three years, <coughs> what the energy use might be. And it's a bit of a hostage to fortune. Um, I've told you that bit, the SAP rating. Um, the CO2 emissions, again, you know how much energy and your fuel mix. So there are indices within the SAP methodology that says this amount of fuel times um, X number of kilograms um, per kilowatt hour, and that gives you a total CO2 emissions rating. Um, the primary energy uh, takes the total energy delivered to the dwelling, and it factors in how much energy is used to get it there, in, in simple terms. Um, so you'll see things like, if you look at the efficiency of electric heating within a SAP calculation, 
um, it will say if you've got an electrical heater on the wall, it's 100% efficient. And it is in the sense that 100% of the electricity that arrives at the heater ends up as heat in the room. But you've probably lost 70% of the energy from the power station to get it there in the first place. So the primary energy starts to look at those things. And um, the dwelling and targets, all it is all expressed as the uh, CO2 um, emissions relative to the floor area of the dwelling. And yet again, you, one of the things you find in SAP when you work through lots of different calculations is that uh, larger dwellings will actually appear to perform better, or rather they are easier to demonstrate compliance with. Um, and that's partly because the smaller the dwelling, the less building fabric you've got left to improve. And because you've got the target is set based on a notional building, the target is always set on the, on the size and scale of dwelling that you've got. So the building envelope is always the same uh, in terms of overall area between the TER and the DER. So the bigger the building, um, the more complex and in one level intuitively least efficient as a mass will give you an easier target to meet. And one of the things that obviously plops out the software is, is an energy performance certificate. Now, I'm conscious we've got about 15 minutes or so left. Uh, so I'll, I'll rattle through these fairly quickly. Um, and we'll have a wee break, and then I'll run through a calculation. Um, the requirement for energy performance certificates comes under two key pieces of legislation. It's the European Directive, which has, been, has now been recast. Um, and then for Scotland, we have the energy performance of Building Scotland regulations. And there's a, that dovetails with the building standards in Scotland in that the building standard says you must have an EPC for a new dwelling at the point of completion. But the way you produce it is using the energy performance of Building Scotland. And that says slightly different work, things about who and where and how you produce a SAP calculation, even though you get, you get a compliance calculation and you get an EPC out of them. Um, which is quite critical. The way an EPC has been dealt with under the Scottish regulations is it's a bit of the house. So you can't complete your house until you put the roof on it, and you can't complete it until you've got the windows in, and you can't complete it until you've got an EPC stuck on the wall. So it's not part of the Warren procedure. You don't even give the EPC to building control before you start building. You only have to evidence that you've done it. And the EPC itself doesn't have to demonstrate a pass. You could demonstrate that the house is not compliant. And that's probably going to be the case as SAP has improved between the point at which you start and the point at which you finish. Uh, all it has to be is there, and it has to be, it's controlled about by who can produce it. And it's something that local authorities haven't quite got their head round even yet. Uh, and in fact, look, I'm, I'm pre-guessing pre my own slides. Article 10 of the EPBD says it has to be carried out by someone who is qualified and accredited and an expert. At the present moment in Scotland, um, the decision about whether someone is expert to produce this calculation or an EPC for a new dwelling is made by the local authority. Um, and it's the local authority who is supposed to check the energy performance certificate and then register it with the building standards register, which is uh, individual to each 32 local authorities. In England and Wales, you have, a th you have things called on-construction domestic energy assessors who have to be a member of a scheme and who have to have demonstrated um, that they have an MVQ level 3 qualification or equivalent and they upload EPCs directly into the landmark database and they are then subject to quality assurances uh, processes. And to a certain extent, some of that's going to happen in Scotland as of January next year mainly because no one's checked an EPC in Scotland. Few... I thought you loaded the EPCs in Scotland directly. Not for new build dwellings. You do for existing dwellings. So existing dwellings are produced by someone who's a member of an approved... has been approved by an approved organisation. However, so far they've been allowed to kind of make their own rules in Scotland. If they're an organisation both sides of the border, they'll adopt what they do in England and Wales. You just do a two-day course on your own EPC assessment. Uh, yeah, MVQ level three is equivalent to an A level. Um, and yes, you can do it through uh, approved prior experiential learning, which is a nightmare. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, or you just go in a two-day course. You pay someone three grand who's got a vested interest in you being approved. No, I did. I did. Cut, cut that out. <laughs> I did one. 
years ago uh -huh. because I needed to for a slightly different purpose. And um, it's two days. Yeah. Pass it, you're now on. I was on the register for a year. Yes. But I wasn't competent to yeah. do a proper assessment. Yeah. Um, but, but I needed to put yes. advice in on how to do 20,000 of them right. quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought I'd better go and figure figure out what it was all about with RDSAP. Yeah. Uh, RDSAP is reduced data and it was developed because it was felt that you needed too much information about a dwelling to do a full SAP. And it's based on a checklist of what, about 30 odd questions yeah. from which it populates an actual SAP calc. So it'll ask things like, is, does this dwelling have a typical amount of glazing, more than typical, less than typical, a lot more than typical, a lot less than typical. And from that all go, well you said it was about 100 square metres, so and you said it's typical, so we'll put 20 square metres of glazing in facing west. Uh, but it then goes through the same complex algorithm. That's why I think it's a guess. Yeah. Um, the other thing about the difference between demonstrating compliance is demonstrating compliance is a threshold. So particularly as a certifier of design, if you say, I think that meets that threshold, and you could look at some buildings and go, well, that's going to easily meet. You know, it's extremely well insulated. It's a very sustainable project as well. You know, it's, it's got everything going for it. Then as a certifier, you can, you can make that judgment to a certain extent. Um, when you come to produce a, a certificate, an EPC for the building on completion, it should, as far as possible, um, match the actual dwelling. So if you were doing, if you were looking at compliance of, say, uh, a ro 100 houses, you would pick the worst one. You'd pick an end of gable on the north. Um, and if that, if you, if your specification was compliant for that, you could say, well, the others will be. But when it comes to the EPC, you're going to have to replicate that calculation and change it for the orientation and whether it's mid-terrace. And if the contractors put a different boiler in, you've got to put that boiler in. If it's been air tightness tested and you've said, well, we were aiming at, say, 7 cubic metres per square metre at 50 pascals and we've got 6.3, you've got to put 6.3 in. Um, so it is actually quite onerous. And as I mentioned before, um, because we didn't have the schemes to uh, approve effectively on construction domestic energy assessors in Scotland, the test was the, the verifier. And as an organisation, the RAS, we recommended to our members as a responsibility under duty of care to their clients, um, they should ask the local authority verifier, once they've accepted it, have you accepted it? Uh, to emphasise the local authority, they've got to check it. Now, the reality is the only way you can check a SAP calculation is to do a SAP calculation. So it's a very onerous task for which they weren't, um, which, for which they weren't resourced. Um, and I've spent the last five years talking about the EPC black hole in Scotland. So, um, What we did get was recognition that actually certifiers of design could produce EPCs. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we suggest to check the local authority. The consequences are quite significant of non-compliance. Um, Energy Performance of Buildings Scotland Act has, uh, has a, a, a sort of different level of authority to the building standards. In terms of building standards, if there's ever a suggestion that something is non-compliant, ultimately it's a matter for the civil courts to decide. And you end up with expert witnesses saying, well, we've, I've read the regs and they say this. And you get another expert witness says, well, I've read the same regs, but I've got a different interpretation. Uh, when it comes to the energy performance um, uh, of buildings, uh, that's actually a criminal act if you don't have one. And the penalties not a one-off penalty. If you haven't got one of these things, it's, it's like a, a, a parking fine where you just don't move the car. Uh, but it gets even more interesting because it comes under, or an EPC is a material consideration in terms of any sale, rental or lease. And if you've given someone uh, a misleading EPC, particularly you could potentially be done under the Properties Misdescription Act. Um, and I've, I've referenced here, I couldn't find a, a Scottish Sheriff Court reference, but it's, it's a conviction in, in the English Magistrates Court uh, for which you can get fined. But even more importantly, I could foresee a situation where um, if you were doing a property deal and you decided you wanted to get out of it, looking at an EPC would be quite a convenient first step to say, well, you know, you said it was a B and now, it's a, and now I find out it's a C. So I'm not going to buy this shopping centre for 300 million. Um, and the fact that you know, the um, financial world has changed in the meantime is not the thing that's making me decide this. It's purely down to the EPC. Um, 
last slide, um, alongside doing these sort of uh, introductory lectures, I suppose, in terms of giving you a feel for this thing, and you'll see more of that when we, when we go through one after a little break, um, is there is a plan to do, for those who are interested, to do more detailed sort of one-day sessions where those people actually want to understand it and do it and get more of a technical grip on it, uh, have got the ability to, to, to sit down and actually do one themselves. So I think we've got a few more questions and then we'll have a little, a oh, few more minutes for questions and then we'll have a little break. So I haven't been, I haven't been bombarded by... Well, let's say within the SAP calculation, there are all these different calculations. Yeah. The SAP bit itself produces the EPC. Really? And, and I've, I've made the mistake, as we all do, of saying it's a SAP calculation when actually SAP is only one bit of it. But it, it's always been called SAP. It started being called SAP. Um, its origins go back to uh, a tool, which if I remember right, it was called BREEDEM, um, which was developed in the 70s and 80s. And some of you may remember when the building research establishment had a row of houses down in Watford and they had light bulbs in them pretending to be people. Uh, and it was that basic data that they took from that to start developing a calculation that tried to mirror how people would use dwellings and how, how energy was used. One of the problems we have, uh, and it was that methodology that was highlighted as being there and available to deal with the EPC question. Um, but unfortunately, it's from that very limited data set, it's been extrapolated to different sizes, different types of construction, different ages of property, different levels of regulation. So that's my concern that the original empirical data is quite small and we are so far away from it that um, it's difficult to believe it's calibrated. Now, you could say, well, it doesn't matter because it's showing a trend. You know, if, if, if the regulations tweak your target and the target gets higher, well, they're still doing what they're supposed to do. Um, the counter view is, well, we've now got vast numbers of energy performance certificates stuck in a database which aren't really very useful in terms of analysis. In fact, virtually nothing. Again, because of the way that SAP software has been produced and because of the limits on the outputs that are required, the information that goes into the central database isn't sufficient for you to take back out and go, right, I now understand the building. It, I'll ignore the calculation that's been done, but I understand enough about the building to recalculate this with a different algorithm. You can't do that. What you're getting is an interpretation on the part of somebody in a piece of software. So, and because the SAP methodology changes and the version changes, you've got different version dates in there. So if you've got an EPC in this week, it will be under SAP 2009. If you've got one in there from whenever it was, two, three years ago, it'll be un under SAP 2005. Could be identical houses, but the 2005 will have a better rating than the 2009 because the 2009 is saying things have got tougher. So in other aspects, I suppose we've coped with that in terms of, say, the fridges, for example. If you look at fridges, when labelling when first went on them, you had... B, C's, D's and E's, pretty swiftly everyone became A or B. Now you have to have double A and probably triple A with stars on because you can't devalue the currency. So you've got to keep finding something on the other end. That hasn't happened with EPCs. So any more questions? No, you can't use that as a compliance methodology. Uh, I did write a paper looking at SBEM SAP and Passive House and the interrelationship within Passive House. Passive House Institute have produced figures that they say will substantiate the accuracy of the Passive House planning package. However, those only relate to passive houses in Austria and Germany. And so the question is then begged, well, if you took a compliant house in Scotland and used the Passive House calculation and you got a number, would that number actually be any more accurate? Uh, you know, my conclusion in my technical paper, we didn't use PHPP on that, but my conclusion in the technical paper was these different calculators give different results. No idea if any one of those is accurate because we're only looking at one dwelling in one place, in one type of construction. You'd need to look at probably hundreds before you could, and, and, and get people to live in them in a standard way over a period of time before you could say, that algorithm seems to match through with all these different uses and different types. The data set is just too small. Yeah. 
it's like the frustrating thing for me is with the emergence of things like BIM and, and, and various other initiatives, we now live in a world where you could actually collate all that, enough information to actually do that study. Um, but the mechanism has been missed to say, well, let's use some sort of BIM type base on which to produce the input information to do the algorithm, to produce the EPC, and let's collect the BIM bit. Because when we improve the algorithms and we understand more about this stuff, because we've now got all these different models, we can improve that and we can rerun them again. And we can scenario plan in terms of where do we, you know, which dwellings have got the 100,000th worth gas boiler. You know, we, we should be able to target those now. We should be able to say, you know, 47 Acacia Avenue has got a bad boiler, and so has you know, another one over there. Write to them and we'll give them a grant to do the boilers. And then we wouldn't have to have all these you know, various policy interventions which try and uh, have a blanket approach. You, know, you could actually target it. I think we're getting there with some, some of the big house associations and that yeah. beginning to, to get there. But I mean, I think I, I agree with you on, on I, I think BIM potentially gives, gives a good model yeah. to, to build things on. But my concern is the whole of the Scottish Government's approach to this is to accept SAP for what it is and to build a whole standard around it. Yes. And, and to continue Correct. towards the 2020 standard. Correct. And it's, Correct. And it's all based on a methodology and it's, it's all based on the work of one and a half people in, in uh, East Kilbride. Yeah. So the whole industry is teetering on and when, uh, who knows what's going to happen when Brian retires. Um, he's a lovely guy, but you know it's all in his head. Yeah, and the softwares are all different. Tomorrow. Softwares are all different, and they're not they're not properly tested. They're assessed. Yes. So they're not actually tested to work. But but that's partly because the software companies existed, and these models exist pre-existed the, these requirements in this legislation. And the government, unlike SBEM, SBEM is a free piece of software, although difficult to use. But you can then get front ends to it. Um, with that, the UK government said, right, we'll pay probably the BRE again to write the software and then we just give it away. But because SAP kind of pre-existed in these various different sort of Elmhurst, NHER type versions, they couldn't suddenly say, sorry guys, your industry's dead because we're going to give your product away. Um, but actually they made their money on the training.